Well, hello and welcome back to the CUNY BMI Conference Day One. We're so thrilled to have our esteemed panelists and keynotes for this afternoon. Let me tell you all a little something real quick. First of all, Dr. Jeff Gardier, who's going to be helping lead this conversation, he has been a CUNY BMI advisory board member for the past year and already has made an impact, impact on us by bringing us not only top tier talent nationally, globally, but also his own global voice that has really helped elevate the cachet of CUNY BMI in the minds of people publicly, both locally as well as nationally. So as we are thinking about mental health and trauma and adjusting to the life of being in COVID, Dr. Jeff is the right person to lead us in this conversation with world-renowned reporter and street um, soldier specialist, Lisa Evers is going to be speaking with us about impacts of uh, the era that we're in and also sharing her story about who she is personally. Normally she's the one interviewing others and asking for their stories, but we wanna hear from Lisa today. Lisa, I'm so thrilled you're here with us. Thank you for making time. And uh, you are going to be an amazing resource for our thousands of students watching across the system. So thank you for being here. My pleasure, it's, it's truly an honor and I'm excited about it. Awesome. Well, Dr. Jeff, you and I are already old buddies, so I'm going to yes. talk you and let you do your thing. But let me just say, Dr. Jeff, obviously, he's a, uh, a psychiatrist and teaches at Turo College and is a resident, but he's also just a really good guy. He's a good dad. He's a good man who is invested in this uh, subject on a personal level and has always already given me personal resources to get better uh, support for my own mental health. So, Dr. Jeff, thank you for being who you are. Please take it from here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sean Best. It's always a pleasure. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this 16th annual CUNY Black Male Initiative Conference. Uh, and we are talking today about, again, the state of mind in the era of COVID, racial injustice, emotional trauma. What happens now? What do we do, right? And we have the perfect person, as Dr. Best has talked about, who's been in the trenches, who can help answer a lot of these questions and uh, lead us in many of these conversations as she's been doing. Again, Dr. Best introduced her, and now it's my turn to introduce one of my very good friends and a role model, Lisa Evers. She's a television news reporter for Fox 5 News uh, in New York. She's a trailblazer in media. Lisa, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit because I got to tell them a little bit about your history. It's a big <laughs> history, but I I I'll keep it short. Uh, Lisa was the first to bring news-based talk with a hip hop flavor, uh, Street Soldiers with Lisa Evers, you know the show, to a major market at Hot 97. That comes on on Friday nights in its TV format. She's a double threat on Fox 5 uh, and runs perpetually on Fox Soul Network, her program, Street Soldiers. Uh, and let me tell you, not only is she the host and the executive uh, producer, but she's a 2019 Emmy Award nominee and a New York State Broadcaster Associate Award nominee. So congratulations on that. Let me point out that both a radio and television show have addressed police brutality, lack of investigations, arrests and sexual assault cases where women were the victims, criminal justice system inequities, negative race and gender stereotyping. And that's why she is here today because I'll focus in this lunchtime series and I hope you're enjoying that ham sandwich with some Swiss <laughs> cheese, um, is black male stereotypes, managing our self images perceived and real. By the way, a uh, shout out to Ron West, one of our producers who helped us put this together. Thank you, Ron. I know that you're watching. He's a great fan of yours, Lisa Evers. So Thank you. Let, let, let me uh, just lead us into this, Lisa. Too often, as we know, uh, we as Black males are the intended target, the victims of circumstances, negativity, fear, frustration, find ourselves being challenged by this term I call boxed in, right? Four situations that sometimes uh, come from overt racism, institutional racism, some from our own frustrated behaviors because of racism, but what it leads to is a catastrophic emotional collapse. You talk about this in many of your shows. What's happening 
happened to Michael K. Williams, right? What's happened to some of our great hip hop stars. Uh, and we know that some of these behaviors result in injury, incarceration, social dysfunction. We talked about, you know, suicidal thoughts and even death, the great DMX, you've addressed that in some of your shows along with Michael K. Williams. Um, we know suicide rates are going up. In a recent study, Lisa, as you know, uh, we found that boys between the ages of five and 12, black boys are more likely to die by suicide than any other group. An increased rate of um, uh, suicide with black females, that's gone up like 140%. Uh, but the goal of this, this discussion is how do we begin developing action plans to create, navigate, manage a new stereotype? So Lisa, question to you, of course, in your great work, you've worked with uh, all of the uh, hip hop community on the streets. What are some of the stereotypes that you've seen in behaviors uh, that have been popularized but have ended in the destruction of the Black man and sometimes their fans, followers, if we're talking about uh, celebrities? Well, uh, Dr. Jeff, first of all, and Dr. Best, everyone on this um, and everyone who is watching, I want to thank you very much for the invitation. And I have to thank all of the Black men in my life and in my particularly in my career from the very beginning, starting in the late 1990s, where there were very few women in the whole hip hop sphere, where there were very few, where there were things going on in our communities. Now remember, um, this was before cell phones, this was before the internet was really widely available to everybody. So there were things going on in our communities that I was observing as a member of the community, as a resident and as a reporter. And there were many men of color who supported my work, who would pull me aside and I'd be like, is this really, is this going on all the time? And they'd be like, yes, Lisa. They would put me in touch with other people. They basically brought me into their networks to try to understand what was going on. So I could communicate it, not only to the African, African American community and communities of color, which were living with this daily, on a daily basis, the, the effects of these stereotypes, but also to the broader broadcast audience that we had on Hot 97, and then later on Fox 5 News, where people, we're not aware that these things were going on. So I think the stereotypes at their very worst can result in violence, like we saw with Ahmad Arbery, where a black man jogging is being stereotyped as a criminal running away from a crime scene, and then he ends up dead. Or where a, a, a man, an African-American man like George Floyd, again, that criminal stereotype proves fatal for him because of this, because of this psychotic police officer who did something that was incredibly cruel and inhumane. And, and that's another piece of the stereotypes that is so negative is the dehumanizing of them. When you stereotype an individual, you rob them of their humanity. You don't understand that they have a soul, they have a heart, they have a family, they have goals, they have emotions. And I think it's especially detrimental here in America when, when you look at the statistics overall, where in New York City, we have people of color are the majority the rest of the United States, it is a very different thing. So th these stereotypes in a negative sense can play out in the way people, if you're a black man going into a new environment, you're looked at, hey, what do you think of Fabio Foreign? And the guy will look, you know, the, the, the African-American man will look at them and go, well, listen, I like rock music or I like heavy metal music mm -hmm. because you're, you're stereotyped right away because, and, and that's on a trivial basis, but on a much more serious life and death crisis, especially as we've seen play out and law enforcement and these issues on the streets that have ended up taking so many people's lives. It's critical, these stereotypes are critical. We need to um, look at them and we need to actively, actively go beyond them, get rid of them and move beyond them. And one of the things I've tried to do in my career on Hot 97 is have a real representation of the community, is have people, when we have experts, we, ju we just don't have uh, the typical that you see on so many television networks, of a white male and nothing against white men. Uh, you know, I have many of my family, my brothers, but it's, and my father, but it's a question of the diversity. You have to understand that there's a diversity within the black male community, within the black male population, just as there is in every other population. And too often that is not represented in the media. We see the rappers, we see hip hop. You know, you wanna see a rapper, a guy with muscles. Uh, for a long time, it was no shirt, this, this hyper-masculinized, image of a black man with the chains, the ghetto, the hood, not that smart, but boy, he could fight or boy, he could shoot a ball or help you win the game. Not the one in the lab coat as a doctor with a stethoscope 
who's saving your lives. Not the, not the doctor like Dr. E. Duroso at Lenox Hill Medical Center, the first, uh, first doctor to get the COVID shot to prove to people that it was, it was safe to take this vaccine so that we could save lives. But more and more, we are seeing some progress with a, a greater representation. And I think that's a very positive thing. And, and I'm happy to play and played and be playing some small little role on that where I'm like going, don't just grab the guy in the corner, grab, look for the person who's the expert in that field that you need. Like you, Dr. Jeff, who've been so helpful on so many of these occasions and put that person out there. So the public, especially the non-black community, whether it's Asian, whether it's Latino, whether it's white, whether it's mixed, which is a, a, a multiracial, we're becoming much more of a multiracial uh, country. They can see the div diversity right in front of them. And uh, let's remind everyone who's watching that uh, if you have any comments you'd like to make, uh, if you have any questions for Lisa Evers, uh, please go ahead and put them in your chat uh, and we will answer them as we go along. We want you to be an interactive part of this. Uh, Lisa, again, I, I do have to thank you for being here and thank you for all the work that you've done because you've opened up so many people's minds in breaking through a lot of the stereotypes. Uh, but it also makes me wonder uh, that uh, as black males, uh, it seems that we fall into a trap ourselves, right? Uh, whether it's a situation of where we feel that just as you said, people view us in a certain way and sometimes getting the positive reinforcement for behaving in that way or the hip hop um, you know, media community, for example, tries to sell uh, perhaps this image of being you know, this rough and tough street guy when in fact, Many of these individuals are not only great musicians, uh, but also are incredible uh, business people. Where well, do Jeff, we begin to take some responsibility for that in the hip hop community? Well, I think we're, you know, I think we're seeing, I think we're seeing that too because hip hop has grown along with this social justice movement, along with this awareness of the racial inequities and gender inequities too in, in our in our country, in our society, and in our world. And in hip hop, one of the big one of the biggest topics that we have debated on Street Soldiers throughout the years, and you've been part of those debates, is do these images when you're portraying when you are when you are turning somebody who and now now it's probably I would have to say because of the things that are going on in the streets of Houston, of Atlanta, of Chicago, of Miami, and and to some extent in New York, Los Angeles, and these other other cities all around the United States. Are, are people being rewarded for being violent? The more violent, one, one, uh, move, one video director told me, I, I said, why are you putting so many guns this summer when we were experiencing so much gun violence, which is still going on? So why are you putting so many guns in these videos? You're putting a 17 year old putting a gun in his hand and the video is gonna get 10 million views on YouTube. Why are you doing that? He goes, Lisa, because that's the way these artists get hot. So I said, but you're giving them that diet. If somebody's only giving you you know, fried food, you're only good. And that's the only food you have. And that's what's around everywhere. That's what you're going to eat, even though it may be bad mm -hmm. for you health wise. So the hip hop community, I feel needs to take more responsibility, because the line between art and real life has been blurred. There was a time where we would say, okay, lyrics, lyrics are uh, art, they are not reflective of what a person is actually doing on the streets. But now that line, especially because of social media has been blurred, people are doing actual murders posting them on social media, using those videos to promote a rap career. And I think for executives to promote that is irresponsible. On the positive side, we're seeing more people taking control, more artists, look at 50 Cent, look at Diddy, look at Jay-Z. There's, so there's so many others whose names are not household names who are now running these corporations, but they're not living in the hood anymore. They're living behind gates. They have security where they go out. They don't have to deal with the day-to-day -day thing of a parent in Brownsville who says, you know what, my 13-year-old son is afraid to go to the basketball court because he doesn't want to get shot. Or like, like some of the families that we had on our Street Soldiers Town Hall who were saying, listen, the teens were speaking out, which I was so thrilled about. And they said, listen, I, 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 go, to, I go to school, I go to my, my team practice, I go to my study group, and that's it. I'm afraid to go out. And we should not be back to those days where everybody is afraid to do what they need to do to fulfill their dreams simply because of this fear of violence. So I think it's I, I think there's a big wake up call for the hip hop community coming and hopefully it'll come from some of these artists because 
We're seeing more and more of them getting killed. We're seeing more and more of them behind bars. And we're seeing the federal government finding a new way to take on cases that get big headlines and make careers for these prosecutors. Absolutely. And, you know, it really does remind me uh, less of a question, more of a comment, but please, you know, comment on my comment, if you will. And as we want you all in our audience to do that, we have some uh, questions coming in for you, Lisa, and I'll get to that. But, you know, I remember, um, and we know I'm a senior citizen, I was born in the 50s, uh, and I remember in the early 60s watching these television shows where, um, you know, the only place that uh, Black people had uh, was really as domestics or, you know, as a sidekick or, you know, someone who just lived in the neighborhood. But you would see the homes of the white uh, folks being, you know, meticulous and so on. And that really, you know, really shaped the way that we as Black males and females thought about ourselves, you know, almost like a, 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 and an internalized racism, right? And now I take a look, let's go beyond the hip hop uh, media community, but let's go to the general, you know, entertainment field. And it seems like there seem, uh, they're, they're, there's a different kind of stereotype that, you know, we as people of color are always smiling in these commercials, we're always dancing or cooking. Um, do you see that this is going in a direction that may not be healthy, that may begin to influence in a negative way, the thinking of many people of color and Latinx people too. Well, I think Jeff, Dr. Jeff, one of the things that we've, one of the things that I've noticed in terms of in terms of the media, and this and this even going back to when I very first started my career with modeling, where there was a, a thing of you could not be in a photo if you were a light skinned woman, you could not be in a photo with a dark skinned man. It was it was just they would ne never publish it. It would not get out there. So we've come a long way from that. I think the commercials where they're showing. No, where, they're, where they're showing an intact family, a happy family of color or mixed or, or you know, multiracial and multi-ethnic. I think that's a very, very, I think that's a very positive thing. And I'll say, for example, I want, I'll give you a real life example here in New York City. Our, I'm sure some of, our, some of our viewers and participants are familiar with NYCHA, which is the New York City Housing mm -hmm. Authority, the public housing authority. So when we would first start to do the, do the stories about some of the injustices in the housing where you know, the majority of people in, in public housing are either retirees or they're low, they're low or moderate income working people and they do pay rent. They pay uh, several billion dollars of a big chunk of the NYCHA budget. So this is not this idea of somebody sitting back watching TV and you know, watching TV and not being a productive citizen. So we went to do an interview and this was a huge wake up call for me in terms of the news business. We went to do an interview. So I had the cameraman shoot the, shoot the, the woman's apartment, the mother's apartment that we were in. She, it was very clean, it was spotless. She had Kurt, you know, it was just like a normal home. What you would call a quote unquote normal home, well maintained, the, everything was stocked. She was doing her best as a single mom. I take the video back and they go, that was NYCHA. And I'm like, yes, this is the way most people are living. It's not squalor. It's not people who, so these, these stereotypes of that, you know, where you have this intersection of race and poverty, and then just plain, I don't want to, ignorance is a very strong word. Maybe I should say unawareness. And it, it's very, very harmful. And then I think, you know, for people that are, the, the other thing that's happening too, you, you talk about these images of the happy family. It's like, you don't always have to be happy. If you, if you have, if you are a black male in America, there has to be, I would imagine, and I know from some experiences where I have witnessed myself, a daily stream of these microaggressions or of unexpected humiliations that you just never know where it's going to come from that reinforces that idea that, hey, I'm playing by the rules. I got my college education. I'm working on Wall Street, real story, working on Wall Street, stop in a hotel to use the a uh, men's room before I go or stop in a public place to use the men's room before I catch my commuter train to my suburban, you know, my suburban home. And that man is stopped by security at the door, asked where he's going, even though he's dressed in a suit and dressed perfectly well. So it's incidents like that. You never know where those things are going to come from. But I think the more diversity we have of the representations of black men, not just on the basketball court, and I, I love our basketball players or the football field, but in the executive suite, and we're getting more of them, I think that's very positive. But I'm, I'm concerned about the youth with the social media thing. 
Well, and, and when we look at COVID, because COVID has been certainly one of our concerns when we talk about what happens to us now, what now, and we'll get to some of those answers, of course, uh, from you and from uh, the people who are viewing us today. Again, remember, put your questions in the chats, but it really does um, remind me of, you know, if the 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 plan is the blueprint that we're given go to school get an education you, you can be successful but yet you know as you said you stop at a hotel use a bathroom you know people are treating you a certain way doesn't that begin to break down the psyche of and and we've talked about some of this the psyche of the black male where he out of frustration may now revert to more uh, perhaps being aggressive, being self-hating, um, maybe not caring about himself as much and putting him again into that box that we talked about, right? Uh, with regard to behaving in a certain way and getting back to some of those stereotypes of being an angry black male. It, it seems like it's an almost no win situation. How have you handled that in your reporting and people who've gone through that, that you've worked with, what are some of their empowerment strategies to fight back You know these stereotypes that are either forced upon us or that we revert to out of some sort of, of anger because of how we're being treated uh, because of racism? Well, I think one of the things that you're talking about, I think this is a very important point, and I, I think especially for our, for our CUNY students that are watching this and, and students everywhere, especially as they try to decide, you know, they, they navigate this terrain of code switching where, you know, you're on the street, you got to walk a certain way, you know, you, you walk into an office building or you walk into your grandmother's house and you have to behave a totally different way. And it, it take, it's, a, it's, a it's a tremendous pressure. I am, I am lucky and I am blessed to be working for a news director, Byron Harmon, who's African-American, who has been an example to a lot of young black men of how to navigate a corporate structure, a traditional major Fortune 500 corporate structure, and still basically keep your soul and keep your values intact. And when I come to him and I say, listen, this is, go this is what's going on. When I started telling him about NYCHA and I'm like, listen, we need to do this. He's like, do it. We're going to stay on it. We're going to figure it out. And he made that a priority, even though maybe other people, you know, there were other people who did, did, did not agree with that. And I think the other thing too, is it's like when you're constantly suppressing, I look at, you know, people think of Dr. Martin Luther King right now. Um, and even Congressman John Lewis may, you know, may they both rest in peace in paradise, which we know they're there. Um, the, the things that they had to endure, a Congressman Lewis came on street soldiers on the hot 97. And he was like, listen, you all young ones, you need to really be strong. I was arrested and beaten 47 times, 47 times. That's right. You know, see him, people see him now, uh, you know, people saw him towards the end of his life as this highly respected congressman, kind of this icon. Dr. King, same thing. We, we you know, we see him as the man that, that finally we got, a, there was a national holiday for a black man. Here, here it is. And it's commercialized and popularized and it's great, but his real message he was very radical for his time and for what he stood for. And this idea of little black boys and little white boys and little black girls and little white girls and everybody being able to have the same equal access is something we are still fighting for today. So I think when you talk about what black men go through, remember the, the black population of America is about 15%. So you have a large chunk of America that is not aware of what the daily black experience for black men is you go and i'll give uh, it, it's just hum humiliations that you don't know where they can come from you have to learn how to keep your cool and i've been always i've been always amazed when you know i will talk with black men whether it's friends whether it's family members whether it's people that i'm i'm interviewing men i'm interviewing for work or whatever it's like how do you keep your cool if i had to put up with that i don't know if i could really keep my temper and they're like lisa it happens so often we were taught I was taught at a young age, you turn the other cheek, which a lot of people do on the spiritual thing, and you have, you have to keep on going. But that constant suppression and that constant not knowing of where the next thing is going to come from, the next emotional hit or hit to your self-esteem is going to come from, Dr. Jeff, I think has got to take a toll all over the long term in these, these health disparities that we've seen so glaringly over the last uh, two years since the pandemic began. And then also in these in this self-inflicted, you know, self-inflicted things or, or methods of coping, whether it's substance abuse, alcohol, or or that type of thing. 
Exactly. And, and I will tell you, uh, th there, there were some incredible uh, uh, nuggets there that you gave. So it really is about when we ask that question, you know, how do you fight off that storm, the microaggressions of being a treated a certain way, do not revert to that aggression. Refer to that aggression with your therapist, refer to that aggression in prayer with your close ones, talk about it. Don't uh, internalize it, you know, have your peer group. Um, when it comes to, you know, the best revenge, it is success and only right. that success. If you can't be part of something, uh, or if you're part of something where they're not allowing you to be you, then you create something on your own and education. Education is not just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's also about history, and it's also about learning the practical skills, because a lot of people are not coming back to college, but they can certainly, we want them to come back. We want them to be part of CUNY, but there are other places that you can learn doing internships, externships, and when you say turn the other cheek, it's not about just being you know, passive in any way. It's knowing what the other person is doing. Turning the cheek is being superior because you're able to rise above that situation and say, this is not my issue. This is their issue. Lisa, let's go to some, uh, we have a lot of questions coming in. And by the way, I'd like to have you all, uh, black male, black females, Latinx, Asian American, anyone, uh, you know, the, the white students who are here. Let's talk about how you feel about this issue of stereotypes, but specifically how they affect you, how they affect black males, uh, black females in particular, Latinx in particular, that they cannot be true to themselves. One of the questions directly for you, a uh, person states anti black male stereotypes can often be internalized. We talk about that uh, and sustained by black women in higher education and professional settings because our black females are always there. You know, they're the foundation. They protect us in many ways. But what can black boys and men do to be seen accurately and treated fairly in the classroom and boardroom? You have both of those uh, experiences at the intersection of race, gender and other identities. All right, well, Dr. Jeff, I haven't been in that position, obviously, so I cannot, I'm not purporting to give anybody advice, but I will share the advice that I have garnered that has really helped me in terms of my life because we're, we, you know, we see, especially we're in an instant society, we see, we see somebody struggling, and then the next minute they're popping bottles or they're, you know, they're looking like a huge success or they're driving some crazy, um, crazy, you know, expensive new car. But the, the fact of these, you know, these, these issues that like one thing, everyone that I have ever interviewed, whether it's been a rapper, whether it's been a sports star, whether it's been a successful business person for a black enterprise series, entrepreneur series, whoever, they all have one thing in common, which is they pick and choose their battles. They have a game plan that they don't deviate from and they don't, they don't internalize every single slight that comes their way, which they're, if you're a, a black man, there are many and they come often, but the one every thing day, all, every day on a daily basis. And so one thing they all had somebody in the corner, a mother, a father, an uncle, a grandmother, a, somebody, there was one family member that was always like, I know what that, I know what those boys are doing. That's not you. I know what they said to you. That's very, very hurtful. That's not you. And you can't, when you are, when you are a minority in a certain country, uh, you know, any country or whatever, where you're going to have to be dealing with different types of people, you have to be so focused on your goal. This is what I've learned from them. It's actually inspired me in my own life. It's like, in, in terms of, in terms of what I do, I would be like, oh my God, do I have to explain that hip hop is now mainstream music one more time? Why do I have to explain that? Why do I have to talk about why stop and frisk is a constitutional violation 10 years before the you know, before it was ruled unconstitutional. I knew it was, the community knew it was, the black and Latino men who were getting stopped at disproportionately high numbers because of racial profiling knew that it was. But I think the one thing all of these successful black men have had that whatever the field is, the one common thread has been, they had a very clear vision of where they wanted to go. And they also had a tremendous amount of self-control knowing when to, when to take action, when to set something right, and when to keep moving on to the next thing. 
And absolutely. And uh, Ron West, again, one of our producers, he's over at uh, CUNY BMI, a, a valued member there, talks about this all the time. You know, we hear the news. The news is different the way you do it. But, you know, we hear the news all the time. You know, I'm on, you know, all the uh, progressive stations and so on. And I listen to some of the ones that are middle of the road and, you know, all the way on the right, too. I want to know what everyone's thinking. But they seem to always report, but never Never give us a plan. And that's what you do with street soldiers, right? It's about, yes, you'll give the information, but it's also about putting together a plan. What do we learn from the individuals that you profile? What do we learn from some of the deaths? So what you're talking about, and ladies and gentlemen, what we're saying to you directly, you must have a plan. Things are changing. The world is upside down. What is your plan at this point? It's not about talk, 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 but putting a plan in place. Learn from other people. Get a group together, an empowerment group, and talk about what you will do. Lisa, I've got to ask you, and 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 I know it may be a little bit of an unfair question, and you know, and it's not about these two specific people, but you've had two recent shows, um, one on DMX, one on Michael K. Williams. Um, we addressed that a little bit earlier. Um, one of the things that uh, we had discussed, again, on your show with some of your great uh, experts that you had on, celebrities and so on, was that in some ways, people like them, not necessarily them, you know, I'm, I'm being careful, you know, um, but people in those roles, black male in those roles, in some ways, are they a victim of toxic masculinity that they have to play a certain role in order to you know um be able to have a certain kind of fame uh whether it's to be a tough guy or a dangerous guy or actually even reading the script as michael k williams had to do of being this tough person do you think those things eventually begin to 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 impact us in a way uh and if that's the case, how does it impact general people, um, black males, this, this idea of toxic masculinity, having to be this tough person to the point of where you can't even breathe as a black male? Well, Dr. Jeff, I think that there, there's a lot, there's a lot there, but if I, if I may just pick, pick a little piece of it, you know, to, to, to uh, talk about, is when you talk about Michael K. Williams, who I knew who was, he was an amazing human being, you're talking about also the acting roles, the the, the roles, and and on that particular show, which which is on, we have uh, posted on the YouTube, is the he was you know the roles that are the most successful for men, uh, all men across the board, regardless of race or ethnicity, are these very tough guys. Whether you look at the gangsters, the mobsters from the past, now the street gangsters are have taken over this American fascination and the world fascination that we have with like the bad guys. But those roles, for them to take on the roles, what, what Clayton Davis, who is, uh, was, was on that show with us and who's a, a, variety, a variety editor and, and writer, he said that, you know, there were so many, there's so many more roles now for black men in Hollywood. That was a big issue for a long time. And Michael K. Williams was one of the trailblazers for that. But he also said that in terms of actors, they internalize, they have to internalize these people. So if you're playing a troubled character, that is going to have you know, that is gonna have a tremendous impact on you. But I think the biggest influence on anybody is that person in their life or persons, hopefully there's more than one, who are kind of like your true north, who's kind of like your guiding, you know, your guiding star, star, your guiding light, that basically when you're ready to just go crazy, I have them in my life, thank God, I'm, I'm blessed for that. You know, I'll pick up, I'll call this friend if I'm feeling a certain kind of way and then get back, brought back into center, get back on track with the game plan. And, and whatever, but I think the whole masculinity thing, there, there's this, there's this, a fascination, I should say, in the popular media with this hyper masculinized role of black men, and then versus, well, you can't be sensitive, you got to be able to fight, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm sure most black men have not been in massive street fights or carried a weapon that, or or done anything that the the media says, but the same thing can be can be said of of some of the. Uh, other characters that are out there for, for men of other races and other uh, ethnic backgrounds. But I think the stereotypes, you know, the more people that are involved, the more people that are in the game, the better. And I, and I, I want to throw in one little thing, kind of a personal, personal thing, 
is of, of hope really and, and of based on fact. And that is that there was a long time as well where there were very few black men with dark complexions because the complexion issue is colorism is, a, is another issue that's there as well, who you would see on mainstream television, mainstream television news on the big news networks. That has changed. And I would say to all of you, because um, I get this question a lot on, on social media, and I would say, especially to the men of color who are watching this right now, there has never been a better time to get into the news business for you. You need to mm. get your education. You need to learn to write. You need to get learn to edit. You need to shoot video. This is the wave of the future. This is how we're going to be communicating. We're going into a global economy. If you are Latinx, if you are bi, grew up in a bilingual home, people used to look at that like, oh, well, your mother speaks with an accent. Well, my, my grandmother spoke with an accent. But it's like you that if you are bilingual, you can get more money if you speak, if you are fluent in Spanish, whatever job you're in, many of the jobs that are out there right now. So the education piece is key. And if you can navigate your way through, through the cultural terrain and have the education, you have more opportunities than ever before. And I, and I do think what we do need to do is start imagining what the future looks like. You know, 20 years ago, it was a battle just to get the story told of what was happening in the black community, let alone what was happening specifically to black men. Then we were able to happen uh, to, to talk about that. When I first started Street Soldiers, I was given a book, a loose leaf, you know, three ring binder with plastic covered sheets called Stolen Lives. It was from the original Stolen Lives project of people that of, of young black men who had been killed by police and nothing had been done by it. And that changed that changed my life. These were these were some of the the black men who helped guide my career and inform me about what was really going on. But I, I would say to to all young people, and I would say especially to young black men right now, you have net that if you have what it takes, the doors are open. If you can stay the course, as James Debose, our uh, Fox Soul leader, says, yes. if you can stay the course and stay focused you can achieve unbelievable things. He, he's did a t he started an entire television network based exclusively on black culture within, during a pandemic and made it a huge success. And if you, he can do that, we can, do, we can all do something because that was something that like very few people have been able to accomplish. But I'm just saying that the opportunities in the corporate world are there, but you can't be like, well, you know what? I don't want to do a corporate job or I don't want to work for a TV station because I have to wear my hair a certain way or I have to wear a collar shirt every day or whatever. It's like, what's the end goal? Do you want to be in a career where you're the one telling the story? You're the one in charge of your narrative so that these old stereotypes are not being regurgitated, revisited, re you know, recrafted and repeated over and over again. We're in an era right now where everything in our world is changing. It's changing. We can, we can be the ones to change it for the better. And if you're one of the people who wants to do that, the opportunity is there using the gifts that God gave you or Allah gave you and, uh, or the universe gave you or your parents gave you and just follow. Or, or, or Jehovah gave you. Don't get me started. <laughs> okay. And, 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 just, and just and just and following through and also cultural cues too are part of those stereotypes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and one of the things that you're saying is don't give up. You don't have to be a victim to the stereotypes that people have of you as a black male or black female. Uh, you don't have to uh, behave a certain way because it pleases them. But there are certain rules that you should follow when it comes to uh, going into a certain profession or occupation. P learn to play that game, right? Learn that language. You know? Learn that language because it's mm -hmm. like, for example. If, if anybody's watching that, you know, I'm, I understand. And I, I came to learn the streets of New York City from the, from the street. And it's it basically, it's like an ecosystem on the street. You can tell when the vibe is okay. You can tell when the vibe is getting, you know, getting questionable. You can tell when it's just get into your house. There's a whole, there's a whole ecosystem that's there. And then, and then guys who are from the streets and who know the streets, they can tell, oh no, she's, she doesn't know how to walk. She doesn't know how to handle herself. This one, this guy's this, this guy's that, or whatever. That same kind of analysis that that maybe helped you navigate your way out of your neighborhood that you started out into a to a safer place or a better place or a bigger place, whatever. Though that those that same skill set translated into translated into understanding, okay, what are the what are the signals? What are the cues in this profession that I'm in? Do I need to 
everyone's dressing a certain way. You don't have to dress exactly identical to them and give up your identity, but you have to fit in with that particular environment. You're not going to wear a swimsuit to a wedding. Well, maybe if it's a hip hop video, but <laughs> you, you know, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 right. You're going to dress appropriately right. depending on what the circumstances are. That, that's excellent. We have a couple of more questions uh, that we definitely want to get to, and we'll do one right now. And I think this one is kind of aimed at me a little bit. Are you talking about me? You talking about me? The person says, yes. how do you help combat stereotypes that have been so ingrained, especially with older generations? They are talking about me. Uh, who hold on to a myth of equality that never existed? Is there a myth out there of equality that has not really been there? Some people call it that glass ceiling. Some people call it John Henryism that we work so hard as black males to get equality, but we do not reach it. What has been your experience with the folks that you have worked with? Is there some, is equality a myth? I know that's a tough question, but is equality a myth or do we need to look at equality in a different way? Dr. Jeff, I prefer the term equity because I, I feel like e equality, we're never going to have equality. You have one person that's a great, has a great singing voice. I wish I did. I would have been a singer, but it's like, you know, other people have great writing skills. I have, I'm a, I'm a good writer. That's why I'm a, in the news business and reporting and, and doing those types of things. I think there's a tremendous sense of negative, you know, I think there's a tremendous sense of uh, hopelessness that a lot of people are feeling right about this particular time too, where they're like, That's right. is, it is it worth it for me to continue with my education? I would say 110% yes. It's not always going to be like this. And I can say it's not always going to be like this because I've been around the block more times than you have, you know, than, than most of you watching. So it's like, the, the, it's not a myth of equality. I want to go back to, doc, to that radical, Dr. King. It's a dream of equality. It's a dream of equity. I believe in, two th in, the, in the 2020s, in this, this decade, we can be in a place where there's education access, where there's, a, a, where there's health access. And now, it's, of course, the person that has $5 million is always going to be able, you know, that's a multimillionaire. They're always going to be able to fly in the top specialists from whatever country on the private jet. But in terms of basic human needs, that everyone is given those basic human needs and those basic human rights. We have people suffering, losing human rights right now. We have people who are losing their civil rights because now in certain communities in our, in our country, in the United States, they're afraid to walk down the street. Kids are getting killed by stray bullets. The, a lot of programs are drying up. Um, because they're, they just can't, they can't function economically or they can't function in terms of, of safety reasons. So I would not, I would not look, first of all, I would not put down anybody from the past. We're talking about our civil rights heroes and I'm, I'm not talking about the famous ones. I'm just a dick. They would be in churches and they would be firebombed. So it's like, there's no, people would just be killed and disappear. So there's no, there's no comparison to what we're going through now. We've seen over the last couple of years, and I think here's where the, the hopelessness comes in. We've seen, especially over the last five years, I would start going back to Eric Garner in, in 2014, a huge awakening about the inequities and the inequalities in the criminal justice system and in policing and, and the fear, the emotional toll that that has taken up, particularly on black men. So, so what do we do now? Do we say, oh, it's bad, all cops are bad, the system is corrupt. Is it? No, we do what some of, these, uh, some of these organizers are doing, what some of our, our new generation of elected officials are doing, what, some of our what a lot of our community leaders are doing, which is trying to create a vision. Where are we going? If you don't know where you're going, it's easy to get confused, it's easy to get distracted, it's easy to fall into this, this just sinkhole of negativity it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. You don't have to believe the stereotypes. You can be a stereotype breaker or a stereotype buster. But the fact is that, that we are in a position right now that we have never been in in our country. We have a chance to really change things for the better. But it's not the change for the better is, is just a slogan. What does that look like? To me, what it looks like is every child in New York City in a, in a system that is one of the best funded in the United States Every child in New York City should be able to graduate with a full uh, an education that enables them to get into a college. They should all have the, the, they should be automatically given 
a, a device, a tablet or a laptop with an L LTE unlimited so that they can be in touch with a modern world. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like going to school without having any books now in, in 2021. That's just mm -hmm. one thing. And then the health equity, the, the legal equity, the economic equity, but the opportunities are there. You just cannot let the negativity slow you down or stop Over, you. Overwhelm you, that's right, overwhelm exactly. You. Right. Absolutely. Dr. Jeff, one of, Dr. Jeff, one of the things you, you, you taught me, I learned from, from your many appearances on Street Soldiers, which I thank you for so generously giving your time. Thank you. Is, you know, we talk about anger. There's a lot of anger. We saw that, you know, we saw that in the Black Lives Matter protests in the summer of 2020. But when you looked at those protests, and this was so encouraging to me, you saw all types of college students. There were many white allies who were there too, who had previously before been quiet or just or, or, or oblivious to what was really going on, they were now activated. We're in a time right now that energy needs to be harnessed, it needs to be focused. And the best way to focus it is to, is to push yourself to become the best that you can be at whatever it is you love doing because the time has never been better and we've never had a chance like this where we really can create a much, much better society for everybody. I totally believe that and if, you know, I, I would always go with the positive over the negative. And if you feel angry, do what Dr. Jeff has told us. You're allowed to express it, but express it appropriately. Don't express it in a way that's going to, you know, don't don't throw something at a wall and lose your job. Or don't start screaming at somebody. If you express it appropriately, you get help when you need help. You talk it out with a professional if you need that to just kind of make sense of everything. You're going to be in good shape. You'll get through with it. Don't don't put yourself down for feeling angry or feeling bad or feeling upset. You know, you, you're entitled to do that. That's your feeling. You can own that, but don't let it overwhelm you, like you said. Absolutely. And, and I'll tell you another uh, great model uh, who's been able to show people all of that is Dr. Sean Best himself, who will be joining us, by the way. He's so excited about your wise words, Lisa, that he'll be joining us. And I know he wants to, you know, ask you a question or two and, uh, you know, get some of that wisdom that you're giving out there, Lisa. Lisa, oh, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, we have another question that came in. It said, and, and I guess this one's addressed to me, but I'd like both you and I to work on it. Um, at, uh, at which point do you begin to have conversations with your sons uh, as an African-American father, knowing that it will harm their view of the world and how they will uh, view their place in it. So I, I will tell you, Lisa, you know, I've often talked about my kids. You know, I have six children. I'm like the old man in the shoe. I have so many kids. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and, and actually I've had, yeah, absolutely. And I've had two of them actually uh, uh, one is in CUNY now at uh, City College. Uh, right. And I had another one who graduated from City College. So we're all part of the family, okay? Uh, but, you know, uh, the bottom line is, it's like how you said, it's not about equality, it's about equity. And so I would say, I start very early with my children. You know, as soon as they can speak, as soon as they have some sort of, uh, you know, understanding uh, as to what race may be about. And it happens at a very early age. Uh, and so I talk with them as to what they need to know. I don't try to dampen their spirit. I don't try to psychologically give them any scars about, you know, these folks out here, you know, they'll never let you do this. You know, they'll always try to get you these cops or this, that. I don't do that. What I do is educate them and give them empowerment strategies and open their eyes as to what institutional racism is and how they recognize it, what are the implicit biases about, but how do they handle those things? How do they uh, recognize those things? And then how do they turn that around? How do they flip the script and trick the devil? I like to say, I'm not saying the white people are the devil, don't you all get me in trouble here, but you know, how to reimagine whatever situation is going on with someone who has a, a particular bias towards you or an overt racism, how you don't own that, but help them to understand that they need help. In some ways, I'm teaching my children how to be superior when they are dealing with a situation of where someone wants to make them feel inferior. Does, does that make sense, Lisa? No, it, 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 totally, make, it totally makes sense. And, and I can say that you know, from experiences with, with young family members who I'm not going to identify because they're minors, 
It's just there, there's there's instances they're, they're biracial and there's in, incidents that happen to them that they just they're they're in predominantly white you know white areas or white schools or white you know when they're visiting or or whatever and these things you know they have these humiliating types of incidents whether it was it, it's over the females her hair is too they don't like her hair looks too ethnic because it's curly and she likes to wear it a certain certain kind of way or because the boy his his complexion is too dark it's darker than everyone else on the team these these types of things i think when especially when we're talking about children it's about advocating for them and letting them know that that you are there in their corner and that it's not for the children i don't think it's their job to educate them i think it's their job to let them know i want you to tell me if you're the parent or you're the you know the the family member that that is where this these incidents have happened i want you to tell me right away if this happens but i want you to understand that there's some people that are ignorant or some people that are uninformed or some people that you know this this is wrong what they said and they would never, um, it, it, it cannot be tolerated. Mm-hmm. It, it can't be tolerated. And, and so uh, before Dr. Best uh, jumps in, the, 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 the question I have for you is, we want to, of course, create a new stereotype and self-image for progress, right? That's what it's that. about. We want to come through this with a new stereotype, a positive one, right? a new self image for progress. So we put this to all of you out there who are joining us. By the way, we have over 650 people who are part of this audience, the largest we've had. So it's been an unmitigated success, just absolutely incredible. But so here's the thing. A lot of people will say to me, because of what's happened, we've lost so many people, so many students have not re-enrolled into college. They've not gone back to community college. They're not part of the CUNY system any longer. We've lost them. So many young people have said to me, young black males especially, what do I need to go to school for? It's a different world. There are no jobs out there. And I say to them, listen, you need the pedigree. You are a black male. You need the pedigree of having that college degree because no matter how smart you are, no matter how much of an entrepreneur you are, they will look at you and say, you don't have a college degree. So we want you to re-enroll and stay in college. What say you, Lisa? I say it's like, it, it's like, it's like the, um, <laughs> you've been, certain, certain, certain areas of the country you go in, you know, they have, they have the handmade sign on the front door, no shirt, no shoes, no service. And that's basically what it is. If you don't have a college degree, you are ne- you are not even getting past go. Are there people that have become millionaires? Let's let's just let just, let me just keep it a hundred. Actually, let me keep it a thousand. Are there people that you know, nineteen years old, and they're making five hundred thousand dollars a year off their YouTube videos and their TikTok and their Instagram and their social media, and they're you know they're doing that, and they don't need to go to school? Well, you know what? Yes, they do need to go to school because they need to know they need to go to school at least to go to take some business classes to understand, to make sure that that, that money, what they're going to have left at two years from now, if there's some kind of crackdown on that or the economy changes or the rules change or they change or their fans change or whatever. So if you don't have an education you or a skill, I would say this too, it's like not a, a Bachelor of Art degree, a Bachelor of Science degree is not for everybody. But the if you you need to have some skill, if you have the jobs are out there, the economy is starting to open again. I know there's a lot of dire predictions about it, but just from what I see, the job jobs are being posted. There's every major you have a major company you want to work for, go on their website. It's the simplest thing. Go on their website, see what kinds of jobs are there, and see what they're requiring in terms of education. You have to have some, you have to have some marketable skill. When I was starting out, I was like going, what's the one thing, if I, if I know how to write, if I know how to write news, and I had a mentor who told me this, he, he, he said, if you know how to write news, you will always have a job. It may not be a million, hmm. you know, you may not be a millionaire or household name or famous or have your own show, but he goes, you will always have a job. So the writing skills for news. So I really worked on that. I worked on the reporting skill because I said, you know what, no matter what form it takes, we're going to, there's always going to be a need for people who, as I, as I tell the kids, tell, I tell, what's my job? I tell the story of what's really going on. And right. uh, in some cases, tell the story of what people don't want to, you to know is going on. Right. But, the, um, but you have to have it. And even if you, you know, the, to the, to the, to the, uh, 
CUNY students who are no longer involved, you know, no longer at CUNY, I would say then take some other course. There's a lot of stuff that's offered online now for free. Get a, get a skill. If you have a language skill, that's, that's, a, that's a huge thing. It, depending on your cultural background, we're becoming a global economy. And that's another reason for diversity too, because there's a lot of these companies that are looking for people of color because they wanna look more international as well. So the opportunities are there, but don't just sit back in your crib, you know, watching videos or just what, you know, uh, binging on, binging on um, TV shows or whatever, unless it's street soldiers. That's right. Um, <laughs> and then, and then expect, expect to have, it, have an incredible life. You can have, an, no matter what's happening around you, you can have an incredible life, but you have to have a degree. That's the gate. That's the gatekeeper thing. And especially if you're a black man with a degree, you're, you're still in the minority of black men. So you are even going to be more desirable and even more um, have more opportunities available to you. So bottom line is the new stereotype and self image for progress is education and success. And that's it. And talking about success, joining us now, of course, is the unsinkable Dr. Sean Best. Wow. I mean, just, I want to give a one man hand of applause uh, for just an amazing conversation. And, um, and being so personal, Lisa, I think you were um, really tapping into personal, your personal journey with your own mental health and with your children and the things that have come up around your way. I remember times being stopped as a young man in Harlem where I live currently by cops because they thought I was suspicious, suspiciously walking on the inside of the sidewalk instead of the outside of the sidewalk. And I was like, what? <laughs> right, I've been, I've been stopped because they, I was thought to have stolen the car that I was driving that I owned. I mean, there's so many things that were happening, right? So we all know these moments of trauma that can contribute to our instability emotionally. And so you sharing your personal story gives us um, hope and lets us know that we're not alone. And that, um, you know, even if, at the level of success that you've experienced, obviously we still have to every day make a choice to battle and to choose to implement mental health resources for ourselves personally before we can even serve those around us. So would you mind closing out with just any tips or advice you would give us that, that you maybe perhaps take a part of yourself that actually brings you balance and stability to your own mental health, uh, sort of, you know, wherever you're at in your own equilibrium, how do you create that for yourself? Uh, because you're always giving out every day. So I would imagine you have to somehow have something poured into you. Would you mind sharing any of those tips or tools? Well, I think so. I think some of the tools for me, and um, actually this was, this was something that, this was, this was a tip that the craziest place I was out for dinner years ago with Tyson Beckford and another and, and one of our one of our friends it was just a, a dinner. We were at the Jimmy's downtown when it was on 57th Street and, and Tyson was like, I ordered fish and it had like the whole it came with the whole fish. And I was like, going, I'm not messing with that. He's like, don't with worry, I'm hacking away at the fish head. And he's like, take it, picking it out for me to uh, to eat or whatever. And he was I was asked talking with him. I said, like, how do you you know, what kind, like what was your rule for success? You're like, how did you become so successful? So he would, he told me, he said, every Sunday night, he writes down what he wants to have happen that particular week. So it'll be like, okay, by the end of the week, I want to have my, you know, uh, apartment cleaned up. Or by the end of the week, well, for him, it was probably like a car or a motorcycle, something like that. I want, you know, by the end of the week, I want to have made three new, three new friends. Or by the end of the week, I want to have reached out to two different new job possibilities or whatever. So those lists, it's it's incredible the power of writing something down. So um, I kind of expanded on that and I do that for myself every morning. I write out, I do put a little ins morning inspiration on social media at Lisa Evers on Twitter and Instagram, which is usually something I have to remind myself that particular day. And then I also I also write out, I, I write out a couple things of thank you to the universe for what happened yesterday. And then I write down, okay, today, this is what I want to do. And then, of course, you get so busy in your day, you forget about what you wrote down, you don't think about it, or whatever. And then it's like the next day, I'm like going, oh, wow, that actually happened. And I didn't have to stress it. So that's, um, th those are some of the tips. And then I think the other thing, too, is, is to, is to really under, is to really know, what, is to start to learn, it took me a long time, but to start to learn when you, you're going, you're, you're one of those modes where you're, you know, you're, I'm Lambo Lisa and I'm going from zero to 120 in like 10 seconds. And like, <laughs> let me step back. 
let me walk around the, you know, I have gotta walk out, out, out of the office and walk around the block and come mm-hmm. back. If I need to call a friend, you know, to, to just kind of like say, hey, listen, just, just calm down. It's not, because when you're intense about what you're doing, it's easy to get very, very intense. So yeah, all right. Probably- all right. That's so awesome. Lisa, very quickly, uh, news reporter, Fox 5, you're on at 5, 6, and 10 p.m. Most nights in New York. And when can we catch uh, Street Soldiers with Lisa Evers, both video and um, morning show? Well, please, please check out Street Soldiers tomorrow night at 1030. We are we are replaying our Vibes Cartel exclusive today. Um, how appropriate is the 10th anniversary of his incarceration in Jamaica? And his, he's appealing, he's maintained his innocence throughout. His appeal is now going before the Privy Council, which is like the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom in the UK. And uh, 10.30 on Friday, uh, 7 a.m. on Sunday, we're gonna be talking about hip hop and health because there is a new health movement going on in hip hop. And uh, you can just follow me. I, po- I post all the stuff, where to find me on my Instagram at Lisa Evers, uh, Facebook, Lisa Evers, Twitter, Lisa Evers and TikTok, Lisa Evers Live. Thank you, Lisa Evers, Thank Dr. You. Sean Best. We turn it back over to you. Awesome, Thank you guys. awesome. Thank you so much. And as we uh, stay with us for just a second before we log off, uh, but just to the audience, thank you so much for being so engaged and active. As uh, Dr. Jeff mentioned, our numbers are getting crazy. Dr. Jeff actually is over 700 now that are engaging with us right now uh, throughout the day today. So we're really excited. Uh, obviously we wish we were in person, but we take what we can get. Uh, stay tuned and we're gonna take another about 15 minute break and we'll be back for our next panel discussion that happens at 2.30. And so please join us then. We're gonna be talking then uh, to a few of our amazing um, partners who actually have been contributing in the realm of mental health resources as it relates to uh, psychological effects of systemic police violence and misconduct in our communities. So it's gonna be a really important conversation with um, attorney Alvin Bragg, who's a candidate for Manhattan, Manhattan District Attorney, uh, Detective Marquez Claxton, and uh, Gloria Brown Marshall, uh, who teaches uh, law at John Jay. Stick with us, follow us at QNBMI, and we will also send some of this transcript with you in the recap as well. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, we will see you in about 15 minutes. And to the panelists, Dr. Jeff, Lisa, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm honored. Be in touch.